Hi, everybody. We're going to make it official now. We're starting. I'm thankful to God for helping me walk through my grieving process, and my name is Tanya. Hey, Tanya. hey so before we get going, did everybody get a handout? Because I have Stephanie in the back that has extras if you don't have a handout to go through, so she'll bring it to you if you just raise your hand. That would be great. And I just want to say thank you, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for coming out and joining us here tonight, because tonight we're going to be talking about a major part of our recovery, which is the forgiveness uh, part of our, re our program. This step is critical for our recoveries, and for many of us, it's going to be part of the hardest steps, one of the hardest steps to apply because it involves dealing with our past hurts and working the process to forgive those who've wounded us. Now, I want to uh, remind you that two weeks ago, Digger taught the amends lesson, and that was about uh, owning when we uh, hurt somebody and saying we're sorry, and um, and that whole part of the process about keep and it helps us keep our side of the street clean when we offend somebody or hurt them and we're uh, by apologizing. So if you missed that lesson and you want to go back and revisit it, you can. It's on our website. I got it uploaded and uh, under our CR page on our website. You can go check it out. But tonight, we're not going to be addressing anything to do with the men's. It's all totally, completely devoted to the forgiveness process. And there is a lot of information I'm going to give you tonight. Your handout is loaded with lots of information. I even have a handout for you to take home, uh, which you can get afterwards, And so, which I'm only going to highlight parts of this. But um, it's really great and super helpful for the really deeper, uh, more toxic wounds that have injured us. And so anyway. When we don't forgive, uh, one thing that can happen, and it can, that happens for actually for several reasons. Sometimes we don't forgive because of the wound. Sometimes we don't forgive because of misinformation, things, the ways we've been misguided in the forgiveness process. We tried it, it didn't work for us. We didn't understand it. We don't know how to do it, or we think we did it, and then we're still angry, and we don't know why. So there's a lot to learning how to forgive in a healthy and a very productive way. Um, and so I do go into quite a bit of uh, details I'm going to give you tonight, and you may have to come back and revisit this lesson, which is being recorded. It'll be online in about a week. So if you need to come back and revisit it, you can, because there's a lot that I'm going to be going over. But one of the main things I want to address before we even get into the topic of forgiveness is what I think hinders and blocks many of us from working through this process, and it's our strongholds. Now, if you don't know what a stronghold is, the definition is a place where particular belief is strongly defended or upheld in our thoughts and minds. And Let's talk about what is a stronghold. You may have not know exactly what does that mean in, in um, having to do with it in this environment. Well, the first way to tell if you are listening to a stronghold is to ask yourself, are you listening to and defending any faulty beliefs or thoughts that do not align with God's word? Because if you are listening to them, then that is a stronghold. Another one that can give us away and let us know that we're listening to strongholds, our emotions give us away. If you are walking around with a heart stuck in a stronghold that prevents you from being able to forgive, you're going to begin to notice some toxic emotions that come up. Emotions like anger, bitterness, grudges, rage, hate, revenge, many others, but those are like the biggies. But there is good news, and I want to encourage you because the good news is God gave us directions and the ability to demolish these strongholds. And it's going to be super important and critical because if you identify tonight that you have some strongholds you've been listening to or following without even realizing it, now you can demolish them. And it's going to help free up your ability to walk into this forgiveness process. So that's why I'm going to spend a little bit of time addressing them tonight. But first, I would like to go over the verse that is the good news verse for me as far as I'm concerned that to give us the encouragement, we need to know that we can demolish them. And it's 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I think it's pretty cool that God gives us a way to demolish our strongholds. And it is nothing we can do in our own power. He makes it clear it comes from his power within us. So if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you've got the power within you already to demolish the strongholds. If you don't know Jesus and you want to receive God's power, you can see me or uh, since Digger's not here, see Dave after the message tonight, and we'll be happy to introduce you to Jesus and get you hooked up and walking, getting going in your walk with Christ. So you still might be wondering, I still don't have an idea what does a stronghold look like? Like, what's the thought I might be thinking? Well, one of them might be if you are living out of a belief that you are not worthy to receive God's forgiveness, 
I know that that thought does not line up with God's word. That is not what his word tells us. But if you believe that and you're living out of that, that is a stronghold. And that has to be demolished if you want to be able to work walking through this process. So once we identify the strongholds, how do we demolish it? We do it by taking our thoughts captive and making them obedient to Christ. We don't have to allow our faulty thinking to control us. We control it by replacing it with the truth. And we continue to remind ourselves of that truth over and over and over until those faulty beliefs no longer plague us. And that's how we become a conqueror over our strongholds. So we're going to put that aside for right now. We'll come back to it in a moment. What I want to do is jump into getting our lesson going. Let's go over our principle and step for tonight. And then come back and we'll address it a little bit more. So tonight's principle is principle six. Evaluate all my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me. And make amends for harm I've done to others. Except when to do so would harm them or others. Uh, Matthew 5, 7a is our uh, beatitude, happy are those who are merciful to others. And Matthew 5, 9, happy are those who work for peace. We also are working step eight along with principle six. We made a list of all persons we have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And the corresponding verse that goes with step eight is Luke 6, 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. So to begin tonight's lesson, let's address what God's word has to say first on why he asks us to forgive. I believe it's very important that we're all on the same page about why we even do the forgiveness and, and uh, forget, offer to forgive people who've hurt us. And the number one reason why we forgive, and this is your first filling in your, your handout, is because Jesus said so. In Colossians 3.13, he says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And Christ suffered in many ways as we do today. He was betrayed, beaten, ridiculed, accused of things he didn't do, and he ultimately died for us when he never broke a law or even committed a crime. I think Jesus understands our suffering and pain that's caused by others. He gets it, and he gets what we're going through. But his father used his pain and suffering to set an example for us. Jesus didn't ask for justice or revenge. Do you remember what his dying words were on the cross? He said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. By following his example, we learn how to forgive and in the process demolish any strongholds that we have that's keeping us from working this part of our journeys. So here's my promise to you. If you try this and you decide you don't like the outcome, you can go back to holding on to all your faulty beliefs and all the toxic emotions of an unforgiving heart that comes with it. I'm sure God will refund your misery. <laughs> but <laughs> I hope instead, after tonight, you will be ready and willing to forgive so you can move towards healing instead. And there's also one other reason why we forgive. And that is because one day we are going to need forgiveness from others. We're going to need forgiveness too. And I know we all would prefer to think about all the people have heard us, what they did, and rather just focus on that. But the reality is we are going to hurt others and we are going to need forgiveness too. And we're all going to blow it eventually. Whether it's intentional or not, it doesn't matter. And when I do blow it, because I will, I hope that you all will forgive me for when I mess up as well. And you know what we're doing when we forgive? When we're forgiving others? We are practicing showing kindness and compassion to each other. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God has, Christ God has forgiven you. Realizing I am going to need forgiveness one day helps me to practice showing this kindness and compassion to others that I need to forgive. So to wrap up, we need to forgive because Jesus says so, and because one day we're going to need forgiveness too. So if you had any other beliefs around why we should forgive, I hope you demolish them if they weren't lining up with those two truths, because that is why we forgive. And now let's talk about um, some other um, uh, misconceptions that can also be strongholds that can keep us from working the forgiveness process. Because there are some that I believe have kept people from able to work into walking through the forgiveness journey because they had a misunderstanding about what forgiveness was. 
One of the, uh, there's two that I'm gonna go over. There's many misconceptions, quite honestly. I'm gonna go over two, which I feel like are the two biggest ones. And the first one that I believe get a lot of people stuck with an unforgiving heart, living in an unforgiving place, is they believe if they forgive that they should instantly trust that person without seeing proof or change of change or evidence of trust that they've changed. Many of us at one time or another have forgiven somebody and instantly trusted them again without boundaries or plan to reestablish trust. And that misconception or stronghold has us believing that if we are obligated when we forgive to immediately trust and reopen our hearts, and we're not. Sometimes we not only reopen our hearts, we reopen our lives. Sometimes it's our house if they are not in the home at the, at the time without reestablishing a plan on how to rebuild the trust. So to clear up this misconception, we have to understand and separate that forgiveness and trust are two totally different topics. They have to be addressed differently when we forgive. Do not intertwine the two or you will get messed up. And why do we say this? It's because forgiveness has to do with past acts, has to do with something that happened in the past. Reconciliation is what's happening in the moment. And the future is about the trust that's being rebuilt. And the other thing about this is you, if you're the one that been, was hurt and you're the one forgiving, that's your part. You are now fulfilling your obligation to do your part to forgive that person. They have a part too. It's to rebuild the trust. They, if you want to know that they hurt you, if you want to know that person knows what they did and they want to change because they don't want to hurt you that way again, they're going to follow some plan that you come up with together on how they can rebuild the trust with you so you can have reconciliation in your relationship. Now, one thing that can happen when we do this, and let me just say this, if you're not sure how to reestablish trust or what those boundaries should look like, please get with a counselor. Don't guess or make up stuff. Get with a professional who can help you make realistic expectations of what would be helpful and beneficial to your relationship. Now, Something's going to happen, and, and, this, and it, it's, the, it's just the reality of what it is. We are human, and a lot of times in our recoveries, we'll take five steps forward, two steps back. We're human. We're going to fall. And sometimes it's not a relapse. Sometimes it's in another area. But no matter what happens, when the person that you're reestablishing trust with, ha something happens, and they uh, uh, relapsed or fell down or whatever it is they did, usually we have a tendency to think what? What do I do? Do I keep forgiving them? How many times do I keep forgiving them? How long do I let that go? Why do I, why do I have to keep forgiving them? What is the deal? Well, God answered that for us in Matthew 17, 21. It says, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven whole times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Our job is to always forgive. I don't care how many times. God's made it clear we are to forgive. If that's your part, someone's hurt you, it's your job to forgive. But you may have to readjust your boundaries towards rebuilding trust. Maybe those need to be tweaked. Maybe they need more accountability. Maybe they need to go to rehab. Maybe they need something else to help them on their journey because they can't do it themselves. Whatever the case may be, you may have to tweak how you uh, work together to reconcile your relationship. So it's, it's really important. Again, we got to separate forgiveness from trust and, um, and then might have to be tweaked depending on how much that person's able to reestablish the trust through being able to follow through on the actions they need to take. And yes, I'm being vague on the boundaries because every person that you guys and I have to deal with and every problem that you have to deal with and I have to, have to deal with are different. They have unique, and they're unique to us, and the relationships are unique to us. And so the boundaries you're going to have to make will be unique to you. And so get help if you're not for sure what they should be or what they should look like. Now, there's another misconception that I uh, believe may, some of us may have to demolish, and it is um, the misconception that sometimes we don't want to forgive because we think if we do, that means what the person did to hurt us was okay. And that's not true either. We have to separate forgiving from receiving or wanting justice or revenge. 
If we don't separate what we're wanting emotionally from our act of obedience of what God calls us to do, you will stay stuck in a stronghold and in this place, unwilling, unable to forgive or move forward in your recovery here. It's not going to help you heal, and it's not going to help you move on. Now, there might be a very slight opportunity for justice, maybe 1%, because it's very rare if there's a crime committed, where you might get some, but you might not. So you can't, you don't want to wait and rely on those things. You don't know um, what's going to happen, and you don't want to make it dependent on what happens to the other person, that you do what's good for you and helps you. One way that I motivate myself to demolish my thoughts around when I want, feel like I want justice because of how much I'm hurting is I have to remind myself that forgiveness is for me, not for them. It's for me, not for them. And it's very important that we remind ourselves of that. When we forgive, it's not about what they did. It's about getting ourselves out of the prison that our thoughts and our pain is keeping us in. And this really helped me when I did my very first 12-step and I had to work on dealing with forgiving my perpetrators, my stepfathers, for their abuse that I grew up with. It took some effort for me to get there with the, um, the abuse that I had to live with and I grew up with, but I will tell you, it was worth the freedom from their damaging effects that they used to try to harm and hurt me. And so if you have been emotionally, physically, or sexually abused as a child or adult, I want you to know CR actually rewrote steps eight and nine to address the issues of people who've been abused. Step eight says, make a list of all persons who have harmed me and become willing to seek God's help in forgiving your perpetrators, as well as in forgiving yourself. Realize that you've also harmed others and become willing to make amends to them. Step nine says, extend forgiveness to yourself and to others who perpetrated against you, realizing that this has everything to do with the attitude of your heart, whether or not it involves a physical confrontation. Make direct amends, asking forgiveness for those people you harmed, except when to do so would injure them or others. So I just want to tell you right here, right now, one reason why I think uh, some people might get stuck in not being able to forgive, because they think if they do have to forgive their perpetrator, they think they have to go do it face to face. They think they have to have a physical confrontation with them. And I'm telling you right here, right now, that is not the case. It's not what I want you to do. It's not what we expect you to do. And I believe that would be unsafe and it could be more harmful than helpful emotionally to you. It's not about doing that. This is about uh, going through a process to work on your pain and what you need to get to a better place to let go of what they've done. And um, the only people that you're going to be sharing about this with is between you, God, your sponsor, and a counselor if you have a counselor involved. Those are the people who are going to hear about it. Those are the people you're going to talk to about it. And that's all that you have to. You don't have to share about anybody else if you don't want to. So I just want you to know, we do not expect you to go confront your abusers and actually do not recommend it. Now, if you're stuck with the vengeance part, like you want them to pay and, you know, why, does, you know, why do I have to suffer and hurt emotionally? Uh, I have to be willing to do my part to forgive. But I, have, I realized I had to let God deal with the justice. And he tells us in Romans 12:19. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And I had to re start replacing when I had those feelings that I wanted justice or revenge or that person to hurt like how I was hurting with the fact that God calls me to forgive them. And he calls on me to trust him to deal with them one day. And I have to let it go. I have to let it go. I have to hang on to that verse, that truth. Vengeance is his. He's going to repay. It's up to God to deal with it in the end one day. It's not my responsibility. I need to stop trying to be responsible, waiting out and holding out for their pain or for them to be in pain or something bad to happen to them because I could be waiting forever. <laughs> Nothing could ever happen to them. And they're running around doing who knows what. They don't even know I'm in pain in this prison to my pain for the unforgiveness that, from the, what they did to hurt me. And so I'm the one being hurt by it, not them. So again, that's another way to get over that stronghold of wanting vengeance. You've got to have a verse to replace and have your truth that you could hold on to. Otherwise, you'll go right back to your strongholds. You'll go right back to getting stuck in the unforgiving place. And it's not healthy and it's not going to be good for you. And it's not going to help you make progress in your recoveries in here. So hopefully, if one of those misconceptions had you struck in a stronghold, tonight you were able to demolish it with some new truths. So now we're going to move on and talk about three areas of forgiveness. Because there's three areas we always need to look at and we should be paying attention to when it comes to the forgiveness process. The first one is forgiving others. Forgiving others. In Ephesians 4.32 it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, 
forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. When we choose to forgive, it changes us. My forgiveness doesn't change that person who hurt me. And I hope you're hearing this. Forgiveness doesn't change that person. Forgiveness changes us. How many of you desire change in your life? I'm going to tell you, forgiveness changes you. Forgiveness doesn't mean you forget. And you probably have heard this somewhere, somewhere over time, over the years. If you forgive, that you'll forget. But the truth is, we don't forget, right? Do you guys forget those who hurt you? Yeah, we don't. And, but every time we remember, I get another opportunity to forgive. And there are some people in my life that every time I remember them, I have to forgive them again. Because forgiveness is not a one-time fix-all. Forgiveness is a daily sacrifice that I have to implement so I can receive what God has for me. And if we don't put into practice forgiving those who've hurt us, then we're going to hold ourselves hostage to a prison not intended for us to be in. So I hope and I pray you will let God change you. Another area of forgiveness is asking God for his forgiveness. God already knows all the ways we try to avoid him when we blow it. I mean, just look at Adam and Eve. They set a great example for us. And we all, we have come up with more ways besides avoiding or hiding from God. We might stuff, push down, medicate, or run from our mistakes. But God is waiting patiently for us to bring our sins to him. And we might be running to avoid facing our actions because we think, and this is another stronghold, we think what we did was so bad, God can't forgive us. And we need to demolish that stronghold because that will also keep us stuck living in an unforgiven place, um, living with our guilt and shame. And it's not how God wants us to live. First John 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Don't let any strongholds, the thoughts we have, keep you from confessing your sins. God says he will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He didn't say some. He didn't say just a few. He said all. And so let me ask you, are you listening to any records of guilt or shame playing in your head? Because if you are, that's a stronghold. And it's time to tear it down and replace it with that verse of 1 John 1, 9. Then the last and probably most difficult part for most of us to do in the forgiveness process is forgiving ourselves. I think this is the hardest one for most people. The other two are, they can do, but when it comes to this one, when we blow it, we might ask God for his forgiveness, but then our stronghold kicked in and reminded us we're so bad, we're so terrible, we can't forgive ourselves. But that's faulty thinking. And it doesn't line up with God's truth. So it needs to be demolished. And a verse that I love for it is Isaiah 43, 25. It says, I, even I, who blot out all your transgressions, for my own sake, remember your sins no more. I know that I have been plagued in my life uh, by this stronghold. And I'm thankful God freed me from it. Once I finally gave and forgave myself for some of the things I've done. I've also discovered there's another very valuable benefit to forgiving ourselves. I noticed the more I learn to own my faults and my humanity and confess them to God, um, the easier it became for me to do the process of forgiving others. I did not realize how much holding on to not forgiving myself kept me in a judgmental place that also did not free me to forgive others. I got to hold myself to a certain standard that I can't live up to. I got to certainly hold all of you to that same standard. And that doesn't help me and it doesn't help you. And I stay stuck. And that's not how God wants us to live and it's not true. And it's not uh, how we do forgiveness. And it's not how the process works. So the more I worked on forgiving myself, the easier it is to forgive others. And it's huge. And please don't discount the importance and value of doing that. Now, with this in mind, let's talk about a process to help us walk through forgiving the deeper, more painful wounds from our past. So if you've experienced abuse, abandonment, rejection, betrayal, those are some biggies, but there's others, but those are some biggies. 
um, you might have a particularly hard time. Maybe you've already been working on some people you've been trying to forgive that has done one of these and created a lot of pain and hurt in your life and it's pain still residing in you and you're wanting to forgive them and move on and let go, but you can't and you don't know why and you're struggling with it and you so badly want freedom. Well, I'm going to get into um, uh, four uh, things you can do to help you work on the difficult ones. Um, and that's what this handout is for. Uh, I'm only going to highlight the four things from this, but if you are struggling with a deeper wound, please get this from the back. They'll be on the back table after the service here. Pick one up and take it home with you because this gives more details. This gives examples. This has a lot of extra information. This is actually from a Christian counseling center that they use to help people that are struggling with forgiveness that come in there. They give them this handout and they were nice enough to give it to me so I, can, I get to share it with all of you here at CR. So um, I first want to just remind you before I get into what the, this process is to work on these harder, deeper, more painful wounds is the forgiveness process. I just want to remind you, never settles who's right or wrong, fairness or justice. Forgiving others is for us, not for them. And we forgive because God forgave us. So I'm going to start off with that, remembering um, the truths. So the first thing we need to do to walk through forgiving somebody from a painful wound is confirm the hurt. Feel the offense. Refuse to insulate ourselves from healing by minimizing the pain with excuses. You know, many of us, when we go to a doctor, when we're injured or sick, we have to describe our symptoms so we can get diagnosed. But what happens if we don't tell the doctor everything? I know, aren't they cute, the kitty, kitty doctor, nurse? <laughs> Had to get my kitty cats in there. Uh, but uh, but it, it can lead to a misdiagnosis, right? Which can lead to worse problems or complications if we don't tell them all our symptoms. So it's important that we tell our doctor everything. It's the same thing. We'll get in trouble when we don't allow ourselves to name our pain, feel the pain when we're walking through forgiveness. That's a lot of times why we're not making more recovery or more progress because we haven't identified it. Maybe we're afraid of it. Maybe we're afraid to go there. Maybe we don't want to feel it. But I'm telling you, you want to forgive. You want to get over it. You got to walk through it. You can't ignore it. You can't walk around it. You can't pretend it didn't happen anymore. You got to walk through it and you got to go back and feel what you didn't allow yourself to feel before. That's just part of the journey. And I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's what you got to do to get through it. You got to feel it. You got to, got to know what it was and you got to go back and experience those feelings you didn't let yourself experience in the past. But since most of us don't enjoy talking about our hurts and how they made us feel, it's easy to get tempted to minimize or dismiss what we've been through. We come up with excuses. And let me tell you, this handout has a lot of great example of our excuses to minimize and dismiss our pain and what we've been through. And they've really helped me to understand that and it's helped me to see when I'm doing that. So if anything, you get this for that. Let me tell you, that was really helpful for me. So I just want to encourage you, refuse to insulate yourself from the pain with excuses. And if you need to get involved with a counselor to go back and visit this pain, get involved with a counselor. Go invite them in. Go work with them on this. Don't leave yourself hanging if you feel like it's something really painful. You're not for sure if you can handle it. Get professional help if you need to. Um, now, one of the ways, one of the things that happens when we are going back and visiting, especially wounds that are really old, is sometimes we don't remember how we felt. Sometimes it takes, we can't get the feelings up. We're, we're trying to remember, we're writing it down about it, maybe in our inventory sheets, and we can't get any feelings. So we don't even know how we felt about it. Well, I have learned one of the best ways to help me with this part of the process is to do what I call a burn letter. Now, a burn letter is not in this. Sorry, this is kind of something I've added to CR over the years. Um, I only mentioned it in your notes. If you want to take more notes about a burn letter, you can. I just didn't have enough room in your bulletin. Um, I ran out of space. But uh, burn letters are super important. It's a great tool to help you process your pain and also get in touch with it if, you, if you're having a hard time uh, figuring it out and, and getting in touch with it when you're addressing past wounds. Uh, so um, a burn letter is what we write to the offender, but we never mail it. And the letter will tell me exactly what they did to hurt us and exactly how they made us feel, the good, the bad, the ugly. And we wrap up the letter by telling them our truth. And our truth will be, we are forgiving them and turning their transgressions against us over to God to deal with. And then we're going to go read that burn letter to our sponsor. And if you're involved with the counselor, you can read it to them. But do not, do not, do not, do not give this letter to your offender. 
You're going to be tempted, I'm telling you, that if your anger comes up like it should when you're writing your burn letter, you're going to want to go give them this letter. You're going to want to put it in the mail right there, throw on it, you know, overnight it. But don't do it. I'm please. It won't help anything. It's not going to help you to heal. Um, it, it, it resists the urge for vengeance. That's all that is. Vengeance to send a letter, a burn letter to somebody who's wounded you. Don't do it. It's just going to make things worse. I believe the feelings that God allows to come up when we work on our burn letters is because he's bringing it to our attention because he wants to heal it. He wants to heal it. But if it doesn't come up and if we don't acknowledge and admit that it's there, how can he heal what we don't admit to? We, we, gotta, we gotta talk about it. We gotta own it. We gotta go through it and walk through it and invite him into it. Ecclesiastes 3.4 says, there's a time to weep, a time to laugh a time to mourn, and a time to dance. So I just want to encourage you, embrace the feelings that come up and allow for them during that time, during when you're writing burn letters. Ask God to help you heal by processing them and then to forgive when you're done. Now, some of you may also find yourself in a mourning process as you acknowledge the losses that might have been created in your life. So for me, growing up in an abusive home, I had a lot of losses of childhood. I had to grieve the losses of my childhood. I don't remember a lot of my childhood. And so I had to walk through, when I was walking through dealing with forgiving my abusive fathers, was also grieving that I, I, I didn't get to be a kid. And so sometimes when you work on your pain, you realize it leads you into having to work on pain from other areas that were affected by what happened to you. And that's part of the journey. And again, if you're struggling with that, get with the counselor. Um, but I want you to know, God does not leave us there. He does not leave us in our pain. He does not leave us feeling that wound. He brings us back eventually when it's time to laughing and dancing once again. So be kind to yourself when you're going through this part of your journey in this process. You will be emotional for a while as you're surrendering uh, your feelings to God. And then after reading your letter, you're going to do the most important, best part. You're going to burn it. Now, I don't care if you flush it down the toilet. I don't care if you shred it and use it for cat litter. Throw it down the garbage disposal. Whatever you do, do it. Do not keep it. You don't save it to read later for prosperity. It is not for that reason. You do not need to remind yourself of that pain. You need to get rid of it. And then the, the, the burning or getting rid of it is also symbolic to show ourselves and God that we are ready to look over the hurt and the feelings that came from it so we can move forward in our healing process. The next thing we're going to do is confess the hate. We're going to face the offense. When you're addressing past hurts, I just want to tell you right here, right now, don't be surprised if feelings of hate come up in your burn letter. Noticing and having these feelings, I want to tell you right here, right now, does not make you a bad person, and it doesn't make you unchristlike, unless... Unless, here's a caveat, unless you decide to act out of them by mailing your burn letter or refusing to forgive them. That's when we're acting out of it. But if you are addressing it, you're acknowledging it, you're telling God that's, and you're writing it in your letter, hate came up in my letter to my abusive stepdads. I didn't even know it was there until I started writing those letters. And so hate could come up if it does. Be honest. God already knows if you're feeling that in your heart. Be honest, write it down, put it in there and ask, invite God into that, 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 those feelings and intensity of it. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 8 says, there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. God can handle our feelings of hate and he wants to heal them but he can't do it until we've admitted it and been honest about how we feel. And then we still finish up that burn letter. These are feelings we're going to talk about in our burn letter. We dress the hate in our burn letter. And then we finish up that burn letter again with God's truce. It's so important to have truce at the end of your burn letter. Do not finish it in the middle of your emotional pain. Put a truth in there. It's so important to be able to help shift ourselves out of the pain to focus back onto the truth of who God is and what he's done for us and about what we're doing in this journey. So don't stay stuck in obsessing over what happened. Move on to surrendering it and change your focus to God's truth. Truths like, I know God has forgiven me, so I'm going to forgive you. 
Another truth is one day I know I'm going to need forgiveness, so I'm going to extend forgiveness to you. Sometimes I'll find a verse, and you got a lot of verses now in your handout on forgiveness. You could put that verse down. Maybe you need to memorize a verse as your truth so that you can walk trans or shift from the, the pain into the truth of what you're going to live out of now going forward, which is why you're forgiving them. And write that verse down. Memorize it. Because when the person comes back up, you're going to remind yourself of that verse or what the truth is that you said to them when you wrap up your letter. And you're going to tell yourself, I forgave them. God, I gave them to you. Vengeance is yours, not mine. I forgave them and I'm moving forward. And I refuse to let it take over control of my thoughts. You control your thoughts. Your thoughts don't have to control you. The next step, after we've done those two and addressed them in our burn letter, once we completed that, we get to move into the next phase, which is choose to heal. Forgive the offender. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Here is where we pray and ask God to forgive our offenders as he has forgiven us. Now, there is a sample prayer in here that you can use to pray from to forgive your offenders. If you have your own, that's perfectly fine. Um, But this is when we walk into that part where we actually choose to forgive so we can move forward, let go, move on, and live out of the new truths instead of our pain. It's a simple step. And even though it may not feel like you mean it when you pray it the first time, or maybe the first 10 times, do it anyway. If you've been hanging on to your toxic emotions and resentment for years, it may take multiple times of forgiving before you feel more connected emotionally to your decision to forgive them today. It can take time to replace those emotions and those resentments that you've been hanging on to and living out of. It will come though. Don't let the work you're doing to get to a better place be dictated by how you feel. Just choose to be obedient to God, to follow Jesus' example, to forgive. Choose to let go and not plot revenge so you can heal. And then we move on to the fourth and final place. And it's where we come to harmony. It's where we choose to free the offender and ourselves. Harmony is places we've come to when we fully have worked and completed steps one, two, and three. We just went over with our burn letters. Romans 15, five says, may God who gives steadiness, Patience and encouragement help you to live in complete harmony with each other, each with the attitude of Christ towards the other. Now, some of you might be wondering, when you're working this process, how do you know if you have arrived at harmony? Well, I know the best way for me to test this, and I think it's actually a good way, and I think it would be easy for all of you to use, is to pray for your offenders. And not that God would smite them and strike them with lightning, but pray for God's blessings over their life. I can always tell if I have arrived at coming to harmony, if I can pray blessings for them without cringing, running, getting really angry or resentful again. If you can't pray for them or you're getting extremely upset when you do, then the work of forgiveness is not done in you. You still have more work to do. You need to keep praying just to be obedient, to follow through doing your part, Uh, uh, keep praying to forgive them each day, but you also need to go back and redo steps one, two, and three. You might need to do one more burn letter. You might need to do 10 more burn letters, depending on how significant the wounds and pains are in your life. It may take a lot more work to get that pain out. You may have to go back to a counselor and get their help to help you get the pain out from the wounds you might have been through and experienced in your life. Just know it's not bad, and it doesn't not mean you're not making progress. It just means you need more help and more time. You can get there. It will happen if you don't give up on it too soon and stop trying to work the process. And sometimes the pain is stuck way down there. And it just takes multiple times to address it and bring it up. So if you feel stuck, again, please get help with the counselor to work on this. Just keep applying the process until God begins to change your heart and heal your pain. All right, so there you go. I gave you lots of information. Hopefully I didn't overwhelm you too much. Uh, Please be sure to grab one of these handouts in the back. Remember, this lesson is recorded online because I know I threw a lot at you tonight. Uh, Give me about a week. It'll be up by next Tuesday. Um, Then you can go back and rewatch it if you need to. 
on our website under the CR page. And I also have some questions I put on the bottom of your handout. If you would like to use that tonight uh, in your share groups, you can. You don't have to. But if you're welcome to, if you'd like to, if you want to focus on, on this and, and start thinking about this part of the process, um, let's go ahead and stand and say the serenity prayer. And I just want to remind everybody, if you're new tonight, please be sure to go back to Double Doors to meet Stephen and Stephanie so they could take you to the newcomer's class um, to explain the program and answer any questions you have. And let's say the prayer.